Hi. Hi. <laughs> Um, backstage, we were just making noises at each other. Like, yeah. we were just going, <laughs> I just feel like that's how I talk to all my friends. <laughs> Basically, it's like, I don't have anything else to say. Like, yeah, it's just a, it's something primal that comes out of you when you're around your best girlfriend. I guess it's just like, just an overwhelming sense of excitement. Well, and that's really encapsulates how I feel with all the stuff that's happening for you right now, with the <sighs> book and the podcast. And you're just, everywhere right now so i feel yeah i feel like people are gonna you know there's i'm always waiting for that moment when people are just like okay go away now I'm no like, i promise i'm going no, away in july not. and august <laughs> i promise this is just for the hot two weeks when the book's out so talk to us a little bit about how you're feeling with all of this excitement and you know this is your second book and is this experience different from the first or um are there any similarities just in terms of promotion and the writing process well, you know, in terms of the, what's so great about having written a first book is that when I was embarking on my second, I understood like that I could write a book. Right. <laughs> Whereas the first time there was a lot of uncertainty about my capacity to be able to fill 300 something pages with my life experience. And this time I knew that I could do that. And I also knew there was like no longer this, it was like a lifted burden of having to give people language to understand my different points of my intersections of identities. Right. Um, and so there was a freeing with with writing surpassing certainty that really wasn't there um, with redefining realness. And so it's been really fun to be able to share this book with people. It only came out yesterday. So I'm still waiting to hear feedback, which I can't wait to hear from, you know, as someone who you have these people who love you online, who followed you for years, who want to see you shine. And I can't wait to hear from those people after they've engaged with this, this current text. One of the things that you talked about, or you just kind of touched on, was like this need to educate people. Mm -hmm. um, and I read, or I heard that you had said that you felt like your first book was the one that you knew you had to write for cis people. Um, versus, mm -hmm. you know, now actually getting to really talk about your life experience in a way that is really just more about your own personal, uh, your own personal story and your own journey. Why do you think, why do you think that that educational part still feels so necessary? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and as a cis person, do you think that there will be a time where we don't feel like we always need that education or mm. like stories don't have to cater to us in, in that sort of way. I think ultimately the work that we both engage in, you do this work too with Decoded, right? Like right. you're telling people, you're giving people language, you're giving people context so that they can understand these slices of racial identity and feminism, right? And so similarly with the work that I do, um, I'm doing that as well. But in the book form, I feel like with Re Redefining Realness, my first book, I gave people all that language. I did all that work already. And so for me to go back and try to repeat myself in the next text and give those same glossary of... of they have homework that, that they yeah, can do. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And then, you know, you know, people read with phone. You know, their phone is right next to them. They can pick up that phone and look up a term if they need it. They just ask Siri. She'll, she'll tell you. People seem uh, to have a really hard time with Google. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. Why is that? I don't know. <laughs> what, what do you think it is? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Often I find myself saying Google is still free. Mm. So if people don't... <laughs> don't know what something means that they can look it up but at the same time there is value in taking that extra time yeah. to help walk them through and that's yeah. something I do appreciate about mm. your work and I, I try you know I, I try to do that as much as possible but at the same time I also know if I'm spending my limited time that I have in this world doing that work that I'm just repeating myself and I'm not actually progressing. I'm not actually trying to push my people forward because I'm trying to grab other people to come along with us. Right. And so I think that that's the powerful work that allies can do, right? They can go and get their people with mm -hmm. the education that they've collect taken upon them. themselves. Yes, <laughs> collect your people, collect all the receipts and the bones and get them going, right? <laughs> um, and so hopefully I hope that, you know, the people that partner with us can, can kind of help and chip in with that work. You've also recently launched a podcast. I have. Um, and the first episode was with the one and only Miss Tina Knowles. I'm dead. I was dead. Um, tell us a little bit about that experience mm. because listening to it, you really sound very calm and natural and like you've been friends forever. Um, <laughs> well, I feel like I've been her friend forever. I don't, know. I don't <laughs> think it's mutual. <laughs> But it was it was so eye opening to just hear the conversation that you had in terms of just hearing about her life. Um, where did the idea for this show come from? And can you just talk a little bit about what it was like sitting down with her and what your process is for having these conversations we've never heard before? 
Oh, God. Thank you so much for bringing up the podcast. Um, Never Before really kind of started two years ago. I'm friends with Lena Dunham, you know, problematic fave, love her to death. Um, <laughs> but so we we were sitting on the couch and she was just like, would you ever think about doing a podcast? I just love like how your voice sounds on the phone. And I'm just like, okay, Lena, I don't have time to do this. And then I thought about it. I went home and I was like, wait, this could be an interesting idea. Your because- voice is amazing, though. <laughs> it's so soothing. It's so soothing. Yes. How are you, Francesca? Oh. Um, but But (laughs) there was a sense of me being like, oh, if I wanted to do this on TV, it would take years of development and having already done that. We know. I was part of Janet's pilot. (laughs) So, and that was how many years ago? That was like four years. Four years ago. Five years ago. So, yes, I know how long that that takes. And so knowing you, you're about to embark on this with Comedy Central with your pilot for Late Night. And I was just like, okay, I just want to have conversations with my favorite people that I never have met before. I just want to sit down and talk to them about all the things beyond the soundbite. Like, how can we sit down for an hour and a half and then digest that down to an hour, perfect hour conversation? And so for me, when we were thinking about a guest list, I came up with all these dream people. And a lot of them said yes. And I was gagged for the gods. I was like, oh my God, I'm going to go to the Hollywood Hills and sit with Miss Tina Knowles Lawson on the balcony where she does all of her corny jokes, and we're going to be able to talk about how much Destiny's Child means to me. And I knew my intentionality was to get that across to her because I knew how much she had contributed as a creative force behind that group. But that was really even interesting, just Uh, hearing mm -hmm. all of the little ins and outs of how she had to make costumes and... And And carry their luggage. Right. And cut out her her blonde highlights to put in Beyonce's hair because she forgot to bring the weave (laughs) for Beyonce to have her highlights for her first video. I'm like, this is mother love. This is love. So, in other words, people have been giving Beyonce their edges since the beginning of time. (laughs) It's amazing. Um, But... What I loved about, you know, you know, the podcast thus far is that it sounds like people are really willing to go there with you. Wh- what? I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, like, I know you as a friend in the sense mm-hmm. that, like, I've had a relationship with you. Mm-hmm. But it was really cool to just hear that people are willing to open up to you. Was there any preparation that you've done personally to kind of make sure that you were ready mm-hmm. to go deeper in these conversations? I think, you know, the... The interesting thing with being a journalist and also being an interviewer and asking questions is that you have to do a lot of research, but then as soon as you sit down, you have to forget that research. And so you have to just trust yourself, and there's a vulnerability that comes with that. And then also trusting myself to be grounded in my own experience and where I'm feeling and where I'm at on that particular day to ensure that as I'm crafting a conversation that I realize that a conversation is an exchange. It's not just me and my questions and the things that I want to say for the day. It's me also showing up. When When they take me somewhere else, I have to follow them. And I also have to be giving of myself. And so, you know, sometimes I've cried in a couple of the podcasts already. <laughs> and it's like, but I also think that there's a safety with that platform and that medium. You know, you have a right, podcast left basis. And there's a sense where, you know, there's a safety because there's no cameras on you. And you kind of forget that the microphone is in between you. And there is something about the intimacy of that exchange in that space that lends itself to these sudden revelations like you know representative maxine waters talking about putting up putting her clothes on layaway as a teenager like it's kind of like amazing stuff that she had never talked about publicly before yeah it definitely feels like you're eavesdropping on Mm. two people just casually talking i'm so glad it feels like that it really does the production's beautiful you sound great pineapple street media i have a team that does it they're they're experts at 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 podcasts they did missing richard simmons they do oh wow they do still processing for the new york times plug 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 Thank you. Duke, <laughs> put them all out there. Put Janet on the payroll, please. Um, so you know that we could not have a conversation and not talk about hair. Like, it's kind of inevitable. Well, it's kind of like our lives. It's like <laughs> kind of how people heard about us. Um, you've been switching it up. You've been doing some different looks. When you had your book launch party, you were doing like a very sleek... I don't know that I've seen you rock a sleek look I've like never that. done straight hair publicly. Yeah, it was like my first time. It was It kind of brought me back to like circa high school when I was like trying to be like the fifth member of Destiny's Child. Okay. I was very much in that in that era. I felt like I was just and there was something about gluing those 27 inches. Like when the first track got on, I already was like doing this. (laughs) It changes you. It just it just it's just something. It's there's some magic there. Um you know our hair is such a big deal for black women just in terms of embracing your natural hair and experimenting with it. Um what do you have any uh, hairstyles that you absolutely regret? 
because I feel like all of us, I don't know about you, but I know when I tried to dye my own hair and it fell out, that was oh, really no. not cute. Um, do you what have. What were you trying to dye it? Listen, I had this girlfriend who convinced me to do like one of those L'Oreal box kits. Oh, like a fairy or something? Yeah. And I was like, okay, sure. And she was like, everybody can do it. And not realizing <laughs> that like white girl hair is different than black girl hair. And I was like, sure, whatever. And just not cute, yeah. clumps. Um, so that was a moment for me. But did you have a time or a style that looking back, you think, oh, goodness, that was... Yeah, trying to achieve Beyonce blonde at 16 years old was not a good look. Um, also doing it over having had my hair relaxed with bleach on as top of it. As soon as you it, add the color I ended on there. Up, I, well, I ended up with no edges. So there was a point in my you know, junior year of high school where I kind of was like, then trying to like glue hair on. It was just, it was a mess. And then like having gooey you know, <laughs> scalp and all that stuff. Um, it's also Pride Month, so mm-hmm. happy Pride. You. Um, you know, you posted, or I think I saw an interview with you where you were just kind of talking about some trans elders and just like the need to acknowledge and respect them. Um, you know, how do you now feel as someone that has become like an icon for the trans mm-hmm. community, especially because you have been so open to acknowledging the people that have paved the way and, and led you to be in this place? Well, for me, you know, I I didn't think the video you're referencing was for Paper Magazine, which, you know, a girl... You're on the cover. Landed a cover. (laughs) Um, But, yeah, and so, like, for me, one of the works that I kind of consistently try to remind myself to do is to speak the name of those who have come before me and who have enabled me to exist, who have offered me roadmaps and blueprints when there was none. Um, And so thinking of Audre Lorde, of course, thinking of Barbara Smith, thinking of Marsha P. Johnson and Miss Major Griffin Gracie and Sylvia Rivera, all of these um, women were pillars for me, and they continue to they continue to educate me and inspire me and inform me and check me and challenge me. And so I hope that for me in the work that I'm doing, that one day some you know black girl or queer kid from the future looks back and and is speaking my name and my work. They're, so that they're doing like it right now. Forgotten. Oh God, I know it feels kind of weird to also be you know in my 30s and to be considered an elder. There's greatness in that in the sense that I can exist and I can be seen on on levels in which a lot of my people cannot be seen but at the same time it saddens me that you know we don't have more elders just because of all of the the lack of access for folk in healthcare, education shelter space safe spaces and all of these things and so for me we just have to keep on keeping on and so pride is a reminder of that resistance and a reminder of the people that that lay their bodies on the line for us to be able to exist and say happy pride absolutely i mean and the thing is is it is a lot of work you know just being visible just uh, being yourself and, you know, you're out here on so many different platforms. Uh, that's a lot of work and takes a lot out of people. What does self-care, what does your downtime look like? I love when I saw Francesca earlier, she asked, she goes, how are you doing? And I was like, girl, I'm tired. <laughs> I was like, I'm tired. And like, that's where I was today, right? Like I was tired. I was a little hangry up until an hour ago. Um, and so I ate a little food that my husband made. So like having people around me, right? My husband is at home. He made some fried rice with okra for me this morning. Mm. It was delicious. <laughs> little moment. Um, little, he, he's a snack himself. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> um, think, you know, so like surrounding, surrounding yourself with people that can show up and take care of you, especially when you know that you're going to be stretched and pulled and having to be challenged and do all kinds of things in so many different spaces. And so for me, I don't do any of this work alone. And so I'm also very clear about, about, naming the folk in my life who contribute to me and help me. Um, I think being able to be clear about where I'm at on that day, being clear and checking in with myself and being present about not lying, not coming into a space and like pretending to be giddy when I'm not giddy, Mm -hmm. but also knowing that a part of this work that we do in front of these beautiful cameras is a little bit of a performance, but hopefully that when you have to be on, through. yeah, you gotta be on. Yeah, exactly. That's what you're saying. Yeah, <laughs> no, and, and I don't think a lot of people realize how exhausting that can be. Mm-hmm. Just like being present and talking to everybody and mm-hmm. having the sound bite. So it's But of course we're not gonna complain about that because we're very grateful. No, no, we're absolutely. Being here. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But like, and also other random things that I do is like, you know, trash reality television always helps me. Uh, what are you watching? Are you watching all, The Bachelorette? All of the real the, Rachel, yeah, yes. yes. I've never watched this show before. It never watched an episode before, but I am just, I'm so interested. I like her. I'm like, why am I so I like it? her a lot. And she's so smart. And, it's, and it kind of 
made me uncomfortable. I was like, mm. I, you know, I went into it like this show is trash yeah. and this is terrible and you can't find, and I was like, oh, I hope she finds love. Yeah, like, I'm I just picking out her ring for her. <laughs> picking out her ring, her little house that she's going to live with him. I'm hoping they have a happy ever. And I don't even know who she's going to be with. I want her with the guy with the gap tooth. Listen, oh, bad. I loved the episode where she talked about the gap in her tooth and how she kept mm-hmm. it, how her dentist said you should get rid of, or told her she could get rid of it. Mm. And then just her saying, like, no, I really wanted to keep it. I thought, like, that is the realest thing I've seen on a reality yeah, show before. She's great. Just and I love g- just how she flips that hair and she does all of this stuff. And then when she checked the guy who had the girlfriend that showed up and he was like, who that? And it was great. Like, you trying to pretend you don't know her? her? Anyway, anyway, this is too much. So many spoilers. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> You've had, like, three weeks to get caught up. So uh, no apologies. But it's two hours long, too, which is, so, which is kind of great because then you can just, like, check out for two hours. And I kind of love that about the escapism. Of and you know what? You said something that I s- repeat all of the time, and I love that you're open to acknowledging that you like mm-hmm. trash reality TV, is that you can be a critical fan and that that is important. And mm-hmm. I think oftentimes in activist spaces, I'm curious to hear if you find this too, um, there feels like this added pressure to be perfect all the time, to only watch certain types of shows, or if you watch a certain show, you have to make sure that you call out every single thing that's wrong with it, or you know, you're know you boycotting a certain thing, and it's really difficult because sometimes you do wanna just check out and watch something that is fluff and silly. Mm-hmm. Um, do you, outside of reality TV, have any times where you think like, mm, I'm bopping to this song and it's horrible, but the beat is amazing. <laughs> you listen to the lyrics uh, or, yeah. you know. Every do time you... I'm on the treadmill, that's basically, my whole playlist is problematic tunes. Yeah. And so, you know. It sounded like I was 80 years old. Like tunes, you know, the whole tunes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm totally okay with that. I'm secretly an old lady, so it's totally fine. Um, yeah, I feel like that's something that when I heard you talk about that um, and saying, you know, the idea that you could be a fan, but you could also be critical was something that was really, uh, really spoke to me. So mm-hmm. thank you for... Well, I think it's like relieving ourselves of that guilt, right? Because you watch things and some things entertain you and you may have to like turn down the volume of your inner like woke critic and be like, okay, right. lie down, girl. I just want to be here and just like take this in. I'll like contextualize later when I go on Twitter and Tumblr with everyone right. else. Um, and so for me, that's kind of how I enjoy a lot of these these shows. If there's something that I feel is like atrocious, like they're, you know, being super homophobic or something, I'll speak out on that Absolutely. publicly. But, um, or I won't follow them publicly. Right. <laughs> so I won't give them that part of the currency of my fandom, right? Mm-hmm. So like I'll watch them privately and consume them privately and get some life from it privately, but then I won't really share or be an, even jealous for them. Who are some of the up-and-coming LGBT icons that mm. you are looking at and saying, like, ooh, I'm going to buy your book when it comes out mm. in a few years, or I'm going to watch your show, or just who are some of the people that we should kind of be keeping our eyes on? That I love Alicia Garza, one of the co-founders of the um, Black Lives Matter movement. I met her at your party. She is so brilliant. Um, I also love Elle Hearns, who also works at Black Lives Matter. She's an amazing black trans Um, young black trans woman, activist. Um, She really helped me as someone who was kind of struggling with figuring out how to critique um, a certain moment that happened with a certain author who was policing trans women's identities. Um, And Raquel Willis as well is someone that I really love. I shared the stage. We both were the only two trans women at the Women's Women's March March on Washington. Mm -hmm. And she's a, a, a love of mine. Amazing. Well, we are going to take questions from the audience. So we've got one over here. Hi, um, Jana. I was wondering what you think about non-trans actors portraying trans characters. Um, I think that there's enough trans um, there's enough trans actors now to take on those roles. So I think that no longer we're no longer in a cultural and even in a business space now where that's an excuse to say there's not enough experienced actors. And so I think that trans actors can step into those roles quite easily. Hi, Janet. Hi. Big fan of your work. Thanks. So you've written two memoirs now and then also some journalism stuff. I was wondering um, what your next creative outlets are for the future and what like new stuff you would like to delve into creatively and uh, in your activism. Oh, thank you. Um, I think that right now I'm, I'm in a space where I want to tell stories on different platforms. So television, as Francesca's embarking on with her pilot for Comedy Central, I'm excited to go into that space as well. I have a show that's in development 
One's a scripted show, and another is one that's a um, docu reportage series on on um, global gender norms. Yeah. Wow, you heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I didn't even know about that. <laughs> Uh, hi, uh, I am an RA at school and I showed uh, the trans list to my residents mm -hmm. and it was so important and opened up such a great and healthy dialogue. So um, can you talk a little bit about developing that, creating mm -hmm. that and uh, you know, making it so successful and so great? Of course. The last time I was here I actually spoke about, I was interviewed just to talk about the trans list. It was a project that largely was in development for about two years and it really started when I was um, the only, I noticed I was the only trans person in the Outlist, which was a documentary that came out in 2012. And um, I wanted to do a breakout list that just focused on trans folk. And what was so great about um, that film from my own experience was that it was the first time in my life that I can remember only hearing trans voices uninterrupted without a narrator, without you know a voiceover, without a journalist. It was just their voices for a full hour telling their you know, multi-layered kaleidoscope of experiences. And it really proved to me that I think the ultimate goal is that trans people are not a monolith. We come from so many different experiences. We had trans Latinas, we had sex workers, we had sex positive folk, we had we had positive folk, we had all kinds of um, different experiences and layers that I think that made me really proud to be a producer and to do the interviews for the trans list. Well, thank you all so much for being here. This was incredible. Thank, thank you, you for taking time out of your busy day. To no, thank you, Francesca, for taking out. your time to have this conversation <laughs> with me. I just, I adore you. I love your work. I think that you're just uh, bright, black, um, brilliant. I feel the exact same way about you, and I will never forget being in Nordstrom Rack on the escalator the first time that <laughs> Janet and I met. She was coming down the escalator, and I was coming up, and she was like, I love your work. And I was like, who was that? And then she tweeted me. And then I was like, holy crap, that was Janet Mock. Like, We've got to do that with each other, though. That is necessary. It we was have amazing. to shout out affirmations to each other on the escalator. Well, we that, that is... <laughs> Well, that is something that I've always really respected and appreciated about you. You've always used your voice and your platform to uplift other people, whether it's Twitter or whether it's so popular. Um, and I, I really respect that about you. And I'm so excited to just bask in your glory and to see where things take you, because clearly you're about to take over the world and I will be ready for it. Please let me keep what little edges I have left. <laughs> That's why I'm wearing a head wrap. True story. <laughs> um, well, congratulations. Make sure that you pick up a copy of Surpassing Certainty. Thank you so much. Thank you. I love you. This Thank was wonderful. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.